Can you give me a summary of your basic notions that you've advocated so far and discussed in various publications about the role of politics in the Supreme Court? Good point. I'd say uh, the essential thing to understand uh, as a matter of human psychology is that um, people have, have priors, you know, they have beliefs, attitudes, temperaments, so on. So whenever a person confronts a new situation, an issue, what have you, uh, before he starts to investigate it, he will have some kind of reaction. Uh, and this is, you know, this was systematized, this is systematized in Bayes' theorem. It's just a simple mathematical formula in which you start with some prior probability of for some outcome of the issue in question being the, the one you want. And then as you gather evidence, that will alter your prior probability. But in the end, when you make a decision, you have a final probability, um, that prior probability is quite likely to continue to exert uh, some force. So I think it's the same with judges. They have priors, can be political, the ideological, broader sense of political. It can be uh, temperamental. People have an authoritarian personality, get very upset by any kind of rule breaking. <laughs> they bring that to the to the case. Or they may be, you know, softies, sweeties, not want not wanting to not inclined to believe anybody is really a bad person. So uh, so these priors are going to influence decisions. Whenever there's uncertainty, there's a lot of uncertainty in uh, many judicial cases. And uh, politics can be a narrow sense of party loyalty, can be a somewhat broader sense of policy preferences. Uh, they, they will undoubtedly have an influence, and particularly in the Supreme Court, because it is a subject to review, so it doesn't have to worry about what some higher court might think. Um, and it tends to get very, very difficult cases. Not all of them, but many of them are difficult. They're taking, they're only hearing about 75 cases out of maybe 10,000 that they're asked to review, and of course part of a much larger universe of federal cases and state cases presenting federal issues. <clears throat> so they have difficult cases. The more difficult the case, the less likely you're going to get a lot of help from research, investigation, what have you, and therefore your priors will play a larger role. So the Another way of looking at priors in this sense are these various unconscious influences that come into, you know, judicial mentation, uh, thoughtfulness, just attitudes that are kind of influenced by previous experiences or... Yeah, I mean, uh, your personal history, family, religion, whatever. Yeah, and I think they're, they're off... They, they, some of them are unconscious. And the personality factors are like, like they'd be unconscious, but also... Um, there's likely to be uh, an attempt at denial. You may be quite conscious of the fact that you are an ardent Roman Catholic. Say. You may be very conscious of that, but you say to yourself, well, I'm a judge. I'm not supposed to allow something like that to influence me. Therefore, I shall repress that prior. Won't allow it to influence. I think it's not uncommon for judges to think that way. I'm not going to allow myself to be influenced by it. But I think it's actually very difficult for most people to do that. I don't think it's uh, always successful. I don't the uh, big swing vote justice uh, Kennedy, I believe, has said something to that effect that 
there is uh, a policy preference that comes to the fore in his decision making process, but then he gut checks it by scanning it whether it matches up with his sense of ethics or other types of you know value structures. And then if they comport with each other, then he feels the policy preference can actually kind of go through as a decision that matches what he seems to think is a just uh, mm -hmm. result. Is that, does that sound like a fair summary of your familiarity with Kennedy on that basis too? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really know him personally. Uh, um, I, but um, I think usually what a judge would say is, well, I'd like to do there, you know, I'm being tugged in one direction by my feelings, but I can only use, you know, legal analysis. I have to test the feelings against the legal analysis rather than testing a policy against one's ethical intuitions. Because then you're still in this world of priors because you can be conscious you, you can feel you're very ethical <laughs> and ethics are very important here. but you might also feel that well when I'm judging my personal ethical views really shouldn't count what should count is precedent statutory language that sort of thing and to the extent that those aren't available for analysis usually the only reason the Supreme Court has a case is because some because lower they court couldn't deal with it, right, exactly. So once those you know, legalistic factors are excluded from the analysis, then what you're left with is uh, future states, essentially, that you're contemplating, like the future implications of a given decision, or these private experiences. Right. Or, yes, how you feel, how uh, it strikes you. Um, now, There are some judges who feel that there is always a, you know, purely analytic uh, ground out there somewhere. Maybe it's in the 14th century. I think Justice Scalia in his gun case, the Heller case, I think he actually cited uh, materials um, uh, law from maybe not, not, I think maybe from the 14th century in England. So, uh, if, if you're sufficiently, you know, legalistic, you may feel very uncomfortable if you don't have a legal ground. You may feel uncomfortable going with your, you know, gut. But if you feel that strong, <laughs> you may be very resourceful in finding legal grounds in uh, unsuspected places. Uh, and to a certain extent, uh, there's an attenuation in these uh, legalistic, uh, you know, try to catch yes, yourself in a legalistic yeah, sense. So, yeah. But eventually you get too attenuated to the point that you're not really doing a legalistic right. analysis well, that's any the, further. One of the problems with the Constitution, the law, Constitu the original Constitution and Bill of Rights are very uh, vague. And, uh, and if you're an originalist, you're going to go to other sort of 18th century things, Madison's notes or decisions in the 18th century or um, what Blackstone said, something like that to try to, or the Federalist Papers, try to find original materials even though the official code uh, doesn't have them. And it's the decision making that goes that necessarily follows uh, vague old law, you know, vague inapplicable language to situations of the modern era, is the, the, the problem that comes with the burden of just having to interpret what the Constitution might have to say about a given behavior in today's society. Isn't that complicated by just the fact that there is nothing in the Constitution to say anything about that, making the idea of constitutional adjudication kind of a uh, I'm not sure if farcical is the right word, but what problems do you see with looking towards situations that and influences and philosophies and foreign law that have nothing to do with our constitution in order to make a constitutional adjudication? Is there an issue? Yeah, I don't think you. I, it's very difficult, really, to talk about interpreting the constitution. 
because um, uh, the words are are perfectly clear. <laughs> it's well written. You know exactly what they're saying. Um, what makes it vague? Really call it, it's not so much that the language is vague. Sometimes it's very, very general. But um, uh, but what makes it difficult to deal with is that it doesn't match current problems. But I don't think you can interpret your way around that or out of it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, they're just you know unforeseen and unprovided for. So the Supreme Court has taken it on itself to decide constitutional cases which have no you know, guidance in the original Constitution. If you think of something like the Equal Protection Clause, that's a little later, that's 1868 was ratified. So when the Supreme Court had you know, Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, it said that uh, segregated public schools violate equal protection. They were very far from anything in 1868. The term equal protection of the laws does not sound as if it has anything to do with segregation. I mean, what they could, what the Supreme Court could have said was, look, um, the conditions in the black and white schools are not equal. Could have said that. It said that. It said that the segregation itself, because it was harmful to black children, was a denial of of equal protection. But that, um, that's, that, that's a stretch, right? That's not really what they were thinking of. And in fact, if, as I understand it, the actual <coughs> purpose of the Equal Protection Clause was to try to uh, require the southern states to provide the same police protection, black and white. Because the fear is that the blacks would be now treat as outlaws and subject to, you know, trolled by the Ku Klux Klan. So, so while everybody applauds the Brown decision, um, to relate it to the Equal Protection Clause is pretty, uh, pretty much a stretch. There are a lot of commentators, and you've discussed several of them in your book, uh, How Judges Think, that take issue with this exact problem of making the stretch of uh, the constitutional text to a given problem, a social public policy problem, and saying, well, the Constitution says this about this public policy problem, even though it's obvious to any person reading it, that's not what it is. They can't even say it, because these situations didn't exist then. So, and, you know, you would think, well, the, the drafters can't be, you know, uh, prophets, you know, they're not seeing these situations, so they write this squishy word equal protection uh, to apply to the future states. Um, so it's, it's a game to a certain extent that's being called out more and more in the literature that the justices and uh, even the lower court justices that have an eye to what precedent what's laid down the Supreme Court has said on these matters uh, is doing. And the Supreme Court continually takes on these constitutional cases. I think the majority of the cases it does review of the uh, 75 per year are uh, constitutional ones, if not uh, like a big majority. So it's taking constitutional cases knowing that the public criticism is that it's not doing constitutional adjudication. Why, why do you think that's the case? <clears throat> you mean why, why do they, well, I don't know, I guess they'd say a horse is out of the barn, can't be put in, it's escaped. They've been doing it for so long um, that uh, it, it would be an extraordinary shock to the system if they suddenly said, well, actually, we decided uh, um, 
the Constitution of 1789, Bill of Rights of 1791, post Civil War Amendments of 1868. It's just been too long. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. We don't know how. They don't seem to be addressed modern problems. So that's. They can't do that. Uh, so they're left with what they've done for a long time, really, from the beginning, is uh, really treat the Constitution as a as an authorization to the courts to create constitutional doctrine. It's as if there were a clause in the Constitution which said, "Well, this is our best shot at at creating rights and so on," but um, we direct that the courts shall keep this document up to date by their you know, interpretation. So that's, they said that, that would be fine. <laughs> Since they haven't said it, the Supreme Court has said it for them. Whenever you do adjudication yourself in issues of constitutional or statutory interpretation as it applies to novel situations, do you find yourself self-conscious of the models that you're trying to discuss here as an interpretation for how judges think? Do you say, oh, I, have these, I know I have these attitudes about this thing and that thing, but I'm going to try to consciously get rid of it, or I'm just going to let it ride out and just see if it comes up with a just result? How do you do your own adjudication? Uh, well, I, I, would, I approach constitutional cases the same way I approach the rest of the case. I would just say, it doesn't sound very <laughs> legalistic. I would just say, what's a sensible result? Um, and then, given this is the sensible result, is there something blocking it, right? I mean, it could be a decision of a higher court, it could be a decision of our court, but it could be a decision that somehow people have relied on a lot, they don't want to upset the their expectations. It could be. It could be. A, they really are some very. There is some precise language in the in the Constitution. This this really doesn't fit. Um, uh, you know, there. I actually think. The two most important provisions in the Constitution are a uh, provision that says religious oaths can't be required for public office, and that there can't be any titles of nobility. And I think those are very important. That's really what, you know, the Constitution is actually modeled very closely on 18th century British government. But these two provisions, are really what break us away from Britain, you know, an aristocratic uh, country with a with an established church. So we don't permit the establishment. We don't permit the we don't make we don't say people have to take a religious oath, and we don't allow for titles of nobility. So those are very very important. They happen to be extremely precise. Right? Mm -hmm. So, but most of the language. Constitution is uh, it's either vague or it just isn't directed to modernity. Um, the one that I think is most uh, usable without embarrassment is actually the cruel and unusual punishments clause, because it, it forbids cruel and unusual punishments without saying what cruel and unusual are. And um, it's, it seems to be perfectly consistent with that to say that what is cruel and unusual, uh, that's, that's going to change over, over time. I mean, clear, most clearly with usual, right? Things that were unusual may become unusual. The usual may become unusual. So that part, that's fine. But uh, the other constitutional provisions aren't, aren't like that. I mean, one is, you know, Sixth Amendment has a speedy trial <laughs> requirement. Speedy, you could say, well, our, I mean, in the 18th century, because of poor transportation communications, might be, you know, the interval between indictment and 
trial and conviction might be long, and nevertheless that would be as speedy as was feasible. Now we can do everything fast. It might be a, but but generally um, we, we can't. Uh, might also be the case that a lot of these clauses weren't written with the idea of a massive population. You know, right? It's hard to predict that anyone you know, there are ten thousand or so in the community, or is looking at an era of seven billion interacting, coming into the jurisdictions with foreign technology at all times. Which is, I think, kind of a good segue because you discuss part of the problems that the court, the Supreme Court, has with adjudicating in the era of like modern technology uh, the acceleration of interstate inter global uh, commerce inter global uh, interstate commerce across the uh, borders uh, with other countries and the technologies that uh, are created by you know manufacturers and producers and the problems that they create they are novel and unique and the court's not really scientific or even scientific enough to really handle a constitutional uh, task that is, is implicated with these machineries. Uh, what do you see as an example? Like, do you have an example of that type of problem? I know you wrote about it in uh, I believe or Forward in the Harvard Law Review, or maybe you wrote it in the. Uh, the what do you mean pro problem? Specific problems that the that the courts are having with technology. With the types of cases that technologies birth, you know, the modernization of our society. Well, um, well, the the most technological field of law is patent law, and um, uh, the Supreme Court and obviously finds it difficult because no member of the Supreme Court has a technical background. Uh, they have because of failures by the Federal Circuit. Which has a monopoly of patent appeals. Supreme, Supreme Court has, uh, in recent years, taken more patent cases. And I think most people feel they've done a pretty good job. Um, without, even though none of them is really entirely comfortable with this. I guess Justice Breyer more than the others, but not completely. Um, uh, this will change eventually because more and more young people get degrees in computer science and statistics and so on. Uh, but that, this is a problem. Uh, another problem having to do with how Supreme Court justices are selected. Not only do none of them has a, has a do none of them have a political have a technological background. None of them has a real political background. None mm -hmm. has been an elected uh, official. And I think that's a big weakness because um, uh, it was very useful for the Supreme Court to have a Southern politician, Justice Black, on the court because he could help them to understand the, so the South and how Southerners would react to this decision or that, and how the Brown opinion should be written to try to minimize the anger of the South. We don't have anybody like that. I think uh, that had serious consequences when the Supreme Court decided, um, well, I forget what it's called, <laughs> whether the Supreme Court was Clinton versus Jones or Jones versus Clinton. I think it was Clinton versus Jones. You know, the Paula Jones sex case. So, so what the President Clinton was asking for was uh, a, a temporary immunity from this sex sexual harassment case that Paula Jones had brought against him. He had two years left in his presidency, couldn't be reelected. So he wanted the two years immunity, and then they'd have the Paula Jones. <laughs> and the Supreme Court, I think if the Supreme Court had a politician on it, he would have said, no, you don't want the president uh, engulfed in a sex case, right? You can't, can't, 
that can't do anything but distract him, distract the country. So give us two years. Paula Jones can wait another two years. Of course, it turned out her case was very thin. She lost anyway. But it was, you know, giving the deposition for a Jones case, and that leads directly to the impeachment. So that was very, very bad judgment by the Supreme Court. Um, it's not as if there's anything in the Constitution about it, I don't think. I don't know. What about immunities? That's a common law sort of doctrine, so it's made up by courts. They can give them an extra two. So, so I'd like to see an elected politician and a, a scientist on the screen. Do you think that that type of compositional change is necessary for uh, an adaptive Supreme Court as the world changes and I as think the so. situation changes? Yeah, I mean, it's got to. It has to be representative, not in the, not in order to. I mean, see. The political concept of diversity is race, sex, I don't know, maybe other things, handicaps, who knows what. But that's not the relevant diversity. The relevant diversity is training, outlook, and so on. It can be correlated with race or sex, but it doesn't have to be. And, um, I mean, if you look at the Supreme Court justices, you have, so you have a Hispanic woman, and then you have other women. Hispanic woman, you have, I guess the others, Hispanic woman, Jewish, two Jewish women. Are they different because the, the, the Jews differ from the Hispanic? No, I don't think they're different. Is, is Thomas, who's black, is he different? He's, he's very conservative. Is he different from the other conservatives? Because he's black? No, I don't think so. Is Breyer, one of the liberals, is he different from Sotomayor and Kagan and Ginsburg because he's a man? I don't think so. So I'd like to see the focus more on diversity and skills, outlook, background, and so forth, rather than in uh, race, sex, sex orientation. That's interesting, actually. I, uh, do you, so in the sense of diversity, do you feel that a diverse background would lead to uh, a more pragmatic uh, or technocratic approach towards uh, legal dilemmas, constitutional interpretations, especially as we become more refined and more specialized uh, at, at an economic scale? Well, I would like to see judges more uh, practical-minded and less preoccupied with legal doctrine because, um, uh, to exaggerate some, the judges judges are a little like, I mean, can I imagine a person who had his head put on backwards? So whenever he walks forward, he is looking backward towards the eye. That's what judges are like, right? They could, they they have a new case. We have a new case, and you know, it's novel, difficult, hasn't arisen before. So what do we do? We look back as far as we have to. You know, back to the 14th century, if we have to, we have to find something back there to decide a case. You know, by definition, it just happens to be it's a new case, a new technology. Well, you know, you have cell phones, so should police be allowed to search a cell phone? Or is it, or is there too much in the cell phone? So, too much private stuff? Well, you're not going to find the answer to that in the Fourth Amendment. You know, all the Fourth Amendment really says the search has to be reasonable, so there's no guidance at all. So I don't know what I don't know what judges can do except a case like that, talking about search of electronic devices and so on. Ask yourself, well, how important is it to the police? Uh, how likely is it to turn out up uh, significant evidence? How much of an inconvenience or cost or what have you is it to the person who searched? How embarrassing is all this stuff? 
So I, I think you have to look at it, you know, modern problems, modern terms. To the sense that that is the, uh, a, a good description to take on. It's part of the problem with the court right now that it uh, is viewed as a kind of bulwark against certain types of encroachments on rights, but at the same time, it's also an imprimatur provider on other encroachments. Uh, it, it's kind of this uh, dual-faced uh, creature to a certain extent. It gives, on occasion, certain extensions of the states into the public life, and on other occasions, it limits the states' incursions into public life. Not necessarily in any, I don't think, obviously predictable fashion. You may have some other insights on that. Do you think that there is a predictable view as to what the court's behavior is going to be in a given rights arena based on you know, various factors that you might be able to empirically deduce about the judges, or is there going to be some kind of a grand or more abstract you know, uh, set of rules about how they... Oh, I think it. it'll be... Oh, I think it's very individual. Um, but one factor that's important is that the Supreme Court is very protective of its prestige um, and, its, and its authority. And so there are some things that it won't do, it might like to do, <laughs> that would be because it would be too uh, damaging. Um, that was the accusation made against just Chief Justice, whether rightly or wrongly. But uh, the argument was that he really wanted to vote to invalidate the Affordable Care Act, but that to, uh, his vote would have been decisive. And had he done that, the Affordable Care Act had been uh, invalidated, might have been extremely harmful to the, to the Supreme Court because Obama would have had to shift the emphasis of his campaign in part to attacking the Supreme Court. And um, if he, if despite the action of the Supreme Court, he won the elections in um, 2012, um, which he would have, that would really have damaged the Supreme Court. So you have the President versus the Supreme Court. President wins. The Supreme Court is really taking a blow on the So I think that, uh, I think self protection is a factor in Supreme Court decisions. Um, but I think beyond that, it's policy preferences of particular justices. Do you think, uh, and, that, and that Obamacare topic, that's kind of interesting, do you think that the Chief Justice actually like really helped to save Obamacare, or do you feel that by recasting it as a tax in a constitutional sense, even though the face of the document would say otherwise, he's actually just teed up challenges that he doesn't have to deal with while Obama's president? Or is that just like you mean that a these, new, these new litigation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't followed the new litigation. We really haven't had it yet. So I, I don't know. But yes, it, it, it does seem as if um, uh, room was left open, whether deliberately or not, for further and possibly very damaging. Whether that's deliberate. And that would kind of presuppose the political savvy of the given justices. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and th that's another thing. You, uh, you have mentioned uh, in this interview and in your book, and I believe also in the foreword, that since the court lacks a lot of political savvy, it acts in a kind of a, a Philistinic fashion. I think you <laughs> said something in that vein. Uh, namely, it's just not very uh, couth or subtle about the political ramifications of its actions, even though it under, understands the policy implications of its actions. Uh, and so in political sense here versus policy sense here, what, what are the distinctions? Uh, 
do you have like an umbrella term for politics that you use when you're discussing the court being a political court, or are there just multiple instances of politics that you kind of have to use uh, depending on the topic at hand? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, there is ideology in a broad sense, which for most people equates to political. It's not party competition. It is uh, political in a broad sense. There's the kind of politics which is, as I say, the sort of self-protective kind. And they make a political judgment that you don't want to take on the president, you don't want to take on the Congress, something like that in a particular case. That would be a political judgment. Um, uh, and there are ideological judgments that merge with the political I mean, so take something like, for, for people who are uh, very orthodox uh, Roman Catholics, so they believe that um, abortion is a mortal sin, using contraceptives is a mortal sin, and uh, homosexual sex is a mortal sin. Masturbation is a mortal sin. Um, those are not political views, they're religious views. But when they become injected into litigation or injected into political campaign, they become intensely political. Right? So we'd say the, the argument against same-sex marriage is almost entirely a religious argument. Um, uh, and yet, it, it has you know profound uh, political ramifications. So, it, so it's hard to separate. Often, it's hard to separate the political from other. You know, priors that may drive decisions in particular cases. And you think it's important to uh, make sure that when considering arguments, the court perceives that, for instance, in a moral argument that's couched in political or policy term, understands that what's happening is there's a blending of moral arguments that are trying to masquerade as a pure policy preference, and that it should be able to separate those two as, you know, I, I, this, I know what this is, this is, this is a mask, you're trying to cheat by making me make a moral rule by couching it up in a policy decision, I'm not going to do that. And to eliminate those types of things from the Supreme Court's uh, view, uh, do you think that that would be a good thing for the Supreme Court to keep in mind as it adjudicates highly contested issues like that? Well, but the Supreme Court isn't, isn't one person, it's right. nine people, and... Uh, it's just, it's not it, it differs from people differ in their ability actually to set to one side something they believe some people can't do it and they may say they're doing it and they may look around but they may be just looking for alternative uh, formulations so in the uh, in the Windsor case, when the Supreme Court invalidated the Defense of Marriage Act, um, there's a dissent by there's a dissent by Justice Alito. So, of course, the Defense of Marriage Act did not validate or invalidate same-sex marriage, it just said that you couldn't get any federal benefits, even though you were lawfully married to someone of the same sex in a particular state. 
Um, so the dissenters were concerned that if the Defense of Marriage Act had validated, uh, the pressure for same-sex marriage would increase because there would be these federal benefits. So, so Justice Alito, in his dissent, uh, he, he made two quite separate points, may have made others, I don't remember. One of them was that a lot of people believe, and then he quoted influential Catholic lay theologians, that as they put it, and he quoted, <laughs> the sexual organs are oriented toward reproduction. So if you use them for anything else, it's wrong. You haven't understood what the sexual organs are for. That's one argument. His other argument was, well, this will encourage same-sex marriage, and we just don't know what the consequences for regular marriage, heterosexual marriage, will be. And since we don't know, we shouldn't do anything. Now, the first argument with the sexual organ stuff, this is, this is just religious. Non-Catholics do not think that it makes any sense. But the other argument about we don't know, we have to move, we should move slowly, related to a third argument, which is marriage tradition is a state prerogative, let the states decide. Those two are not uh, religious. A anybody could make arguments like that. Then the question would be, well, does anyone who isn't religious make arguments like that? Or is it just people who have this strong religious revulsion to homosexuality? Is it that those people, consciously or unconsciously, are trying to find a secular reason to justify their position? It's not respectable to use your religious beliefs to make a religious In the same vein, though, no one's taking surveys of uh, people and like, are you secular? Are you atheist? Do you yeah. think gay <laughs> sex is bad? It's like, yeah, okay, good. It's got my citation, you know? Oh, I thought you were asking yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> we'll scratch that off if that's the case. <laughs> but I feel like people aren't taking these types of surveys uh, and then walking out and then putting it in their, their footnote to validate their proposition. So to a certain extent, yeah, you could probably theorize that there is some abstract atheist out there, you know, a uh, notional atheist that doesn't support gay marriage. And then you could say, because I have this, you know, atheist out there that doesn't support gay marriage, it's not a religious argument. It's just a, it's a secular argument. But it That's interesting, actually. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, there are, there have, of course, been a lot of surveys of support of same-sex marriage, but uh, I don't think they are. I don't think they ever ask. They just ask them, you know, for or against. I don't think they ask them about their religious views. Or, you know, that's interesting. It, it might balance out the next yeah. footnote instead of citing to like you know the priests. Or whatever, no. like Alito was doing. Um, I, mean, I don't think the atheists care in the sense that, uh, well, it's very hard to figure out. Um, I think for most people, it feels hard to figure out how uh, allowing homosexuals to marry is going to affect you, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're heterosexual, what exactly? You may think it very strange. You may think, you know, sexual activity is weird, who would want to do that? But, but you, you would have difficulty, you might have difficulty seeing how you could be, how, how the people in the conventional marriages could be harmed. And so it's hard to get excited, but you know that there are a number of people, it's a small percentage, you know that a lot of people, they're homosexual, and necessarily they didn't choose it, just the way you're, you're born, basically. And uh, so for them, homosexual marriage is very important. For the rest of us, it doesn't seem to, to, to matter. So if you have a bunch of people who want to do this very much, and it's hard to get excited. 
unless you have these religious views, right? Right. Then you get very, you get very disturbed. I mean, I, I think uh, didn't Jerry Falwell say that the reason for the 9/11 attacks was that God was angry at the amount of homosexual number of homosexuals in New York. I might, like might be Falwell. I thought he was disgraced so much in the 80s he wasn't allowed back on <laughs> TV. Maybe it was Pat Robertson, one of the Robertson, Pat Robertson, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bench press guy. That's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, people make a lot of absurd arguments. Um, and the Bible, I, uh, I don't know if my readings of that, it kind of provides some pretty funny anecdotes for people who believe the Bible is like 100% true. They say stuff like, well, in the Bible, uh, there's a city full of homosexuals and, you know, God sent a big meteor and blew it out of the water, you know, and that was Sodom and Gomorrah story. So then people like turn to stuff like that and say like, well, my God, you know, hates homosexuals. And I know this because I have a book here that says right, it. Sure. And uh, then <laughs> those people are really hard to talk to in a rational way. Uh, and so usually what has to happen in that type of debate is you, you have to frame it in the religious context itself. Which is not really, I think, the role of the courts, and much less. Right. No, the court could not could not have a religion an argument over. You know, they wouldn't ever dare to to question people who believe in you know biblical inerrancy. Which is problematic for its legitimacy in the eyes of this population, this vocal, you know, what the moral majority type of a group uh, that has an articulate and well funded, you know party platform that says, I disagree with every decision that cuts against this set of moral prescripts that I have. One of them being, you know, no homosexual marriage allowed in America, because America is Christian, and so on and so forth. And when the court can't even acknowledge the, these, you know, very well-funded, popular, you know, arguments, uh, it, to a certain extent, I think, hurts itself because it can't take these things on a serious basis, which is uh, a problem, I think, in the legitimation of its decisions. And that's cuts it. So it's a liberal court. It's a liberal court. You know, it's a conservative court. You know, and all and all. Uh, I don't know. I think it's kind of an interesting tension with the public and the uh, court at that level, um, and possibly kind of, I think, always renews itself in uh, each uh, justice appointment procedure. Like, how conservative are you? How liberal are you? Uh, how do you know? It's like, well, I was appointed by a Republican president, so I guess by proxy, I'm conservative. Uh, and I think you've written a lot on that topic too. Uh, the notion of like the poor fit of the uh, party selecting a judicial candidate to the court um, as a measure of his ideological position is that the is that what you still hold? There's a misfit between saying this guy's appointed by a Republican, therefore he'll be more conservative than not. Well, in the old days, I think. Um Party identity uh, meant less, and um, you know, until really, uh, until really Nixon's presidency, uh, when the Demo Southern Democrats, uh, well, it was really during the '60s, but Nixon exploited it skillfully. Uh, before then, the Southern whites, although conservative, had been Democrats. And they weren't uniformly conservative, conservative mainly on racial issues, but they tended to be uh, populist and you know, hostile to big business and so on. So the Democratic and Republican parties were not really sharply distinguished, distinguishable. Now they seem to be um, much farther apart, but um, uh, but certainly there have been appointments of justices expected to be conservative, like Blackman and Souter, who turned out not to be, or Kennedy turned out to be quasi-conservative. Um, but, but now I think the parties and the president and so on, they're much more conscious of the danger of being betrayed <laughs> by one of their appointees. Going back to the, uh, just the last bit of the Alito dissent, the notion that 
if you don't know what the consequences of a given decision would be, you should abdicate, you know, making a decision on it. Do you think there's a value in that as a political position for the court and its justices to take? That is to say, we don't know enough about social science, we don't know enough about projective metrics, about the impact of this. We really don't feel comfortable making a call as a final federal policy for the United States of America, so we're not going to act on this. Uh, yeah, no, I can see that that would be prudent. Um, what one would have liked to see, I would think, in Alito's invocation of uncertainty, is some sense of what are the bad things that might happen, right? If you couldn't even think of a bad thing that would happen, then it would be very dubious. So if he had said, well, somehow if same-sex marriage is alive, it will de somehow the heterosexuals will feel that their marriage is devalued. And um, when they feel that the marriage rate, which is already low and dropping, will drop even more for, for heterosexuals. That'll be bad for children. And I don't think he said, I don't think he said that. that the, I don't think it's true, but I think it's the kind of thing that you'd want to think about that, that possibility. As I say, I don't really think people care that much about other people's marriages. I think the reason for non-marriage is more to do with inability to support someone else than it has anything to do with the fact that if homosexuals are getting allowed to marry each other, then marriage is trash. I don't think that's a widespread attitude. So in briefing to the court, do you think that the best types of arguments would be ones that try to look at possible outcomes in the yeah. negative if you go against the decision. Actually, the this moment. is one that, I, I, I actually, I think, I think um, yeah, I think I saw an article about this. Yeah, they looked at marriage rates in states that do and do not allow same-sex marriage. So the proposition would be that if, you know, heterosexual marriage feels devalued when homosexual marriage is, is allowed, that you expect the heterosexual conventional marriage rate in those states to drop. Because Massachusetts, now you don't have a long period, but I think Massachusetts has had same-sex marriage since 2001. In fact, apparently there's no change in Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. Well, it would kind of undercut against it. Yeah. But it certainly wouldn't undercut against the idea of public uh, contempt, you know, that might be generated as among, you know, members that hold hostile attitudes towards homosexuals, generally speaking. But then you might say, well, was that ever going to change? You know, is this going to really impact that that much greater? I don't know. So I can I see that. Uh, regarding just a different topic altogether, the bureaucratization of the court as far as the number of clerks and the quality of clerks mm -hmm. go. You've written about that. I'm not sure how much more extensively you've written about it, but I know you talked about it in, um, in How Judges Think, and I know you've written about it in other uh, articles. Namely, it's just there's a lot more clerks out there, and they're usually better trained. And the old process was Supreme Court justices really didn't care who their clerk was. They would just kind of tell Buddy, hey, I need some guys to come help me, send them over. And then they just get some person in the room that they didn't even interview. And now it's this, it's this, uh, this, uh, you know, Oscar systems involved oh, yeah, now. You know, yeah. this whole circus uh, to get a clerk at any level of the judiciary, especially the federal judiciary. And then, especially for Supreme Court, they don't even have. I think I know, I'm not sure if it's 100 percent now, but they don't even take uh, clerks that didn't have prior district court experience, at least, or lower court experience. Court appeals. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Big changes, you know, in the yeah. composition of the clerkship. Yeah. What types of political ramifications do you think that that's had on Supreme Court adjudication? Political? Uh -huh. Do you think it has had one, or do you think it's more of, no, a, of a procedural aspect? Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I would be surprised if the 
law clerks had a significant influence, significant influence on outcomes. Um, it is, it is very strange. So when I clerked for Supreme Court in 1962, uh, they just had two law clerks, and as you said, each, you know, each had two. And as you said, the the process of of selection was much more casual, and uh, not only that, it wasn't really that covet of a job. Uh, I didn't apply, actually. Well, most there, some people applied, but often the Supreme Court justice would have delegated the appointment to a, a professor. That's what Brennan had done in Harvard. So um, uh, I, I I wasn't particularly interested since I I was appointed by Professor Freud, who was Brennan's agent. Harvard. So I accepted. I thought it would be uh, interesting, but I, I, I was. I said I, I would not have applied. I didn't bother to apply. But now it's become very coveted. Of course, one difference is the uh, the signing bonuses at law firms. They were unknown, of course. Now they're up to three hundred thousand dollars. That's just a signing. So, um, so yeah, there's a quite a mad scramble, and some of the court of appeals judges try to very hard to uh, get their law clerks hired by the Supreme Court because that makes them more desirable as the first judge for the Peter for the judge, yeah. yeah. That's kind of absurd. Yeah, that goes on. Uh, what, well, what type of value, in term, besides just mere prestige, uh, which kind of seems to have been phenomenal just overnight, like one day there's just a prestige factor about being a law clerk at that level, uh, what do you think makes the law clerk so valuable to the private side of law coming out? Oh, what I think it is primarily is that... Um, Maybe I'm duly cynical, but uh, if you're the general counsel of a big corporation, what is it you most dread? Well, what you most dread is having to tell your CEO that you lost a case, because of course the CEO they don't like lawyers anyway. They don't like their legal department because it doesn't generate, usually not generate any net income. So they're prepared to think badly of lawyers. So one of the standard things you say as a general counsel is, well, you know, we, we knew this was an important case. We spared nothing. We got this firm which has 10 former Supreme Court lawyers. That's the pick of the litter. We did everything. And we lost because you know I had a stupid charge. So it's very valuable to be able to that. What and of course what that means is that the firm that has the uh, the the Supreme Court law clerks will do better getting this corporate business because the, the general counsel will be reassured that she's she this is, this is protection. She has. Should, should she lose? And um, I've been told, I don't know whether it's true, but I no reason to doubt it's true, that there are companies that sometimes they will deliberately overpay their lawyer. Law firm will ask for X hundred thousand, they'll say, well, we'll give you another. And the reason for this is, again, if they lose, they'll go to their boss and say, look, we, we knew this was an important case. We didn't want to, you know, penny wise, pound foolish. We paid all this money to this really good law firm, and because of a bad judge, 
bad luck, change in law, what have you, we lost. And that's kind of shocking that you actually be paying, and maybe it's not true, but that's a telephone story. Um, but that suggests how, you know, Darwinian the competition is in business, and no one's job is really secure. You can be fired because you lost a case, general counsel. So you'll do anything. And the Supreme Court law clerk, law clerks working for firms, they're helping to protect the, the general counsel. Interesting. Uh, this idea, the, the, I guess that's kind of a promotional concept, uh, the idea of being promoted out of the Supreme Court into a really nice prestigious law firm. And that's something that you had talked about as well as kind of the uh, lack of a, uh, a constraint that tends to promote the type of democratic aspect of the court. It doesn't have these you know, bribes on the outside like the, the dangling carrots like you have with uh, department officials who once they're done running a department forever can just book over to Goldman Sachs or something for a couple million a year uh, after they're done doing whatever they're doing. The Supreme Court doesn't do that. The Supreme Court usually just hangs around as the Supreme Court justice, and most justices do this at the federal level. Is that, uh, is that right? No, what you're saying... The carrot of they the... Never, they never... The Supreme Court justices never resign and take another job. Well, that? they don't tend to, right? Yeah, Whitaker did. It's extremely rare. Uh, I mean, Hughes, when he was associate justice, resigned to run against Wilson for president. Uh, there was another one, Justice Clark resigned to join the predecessor to the World Court, but it's very rare. Yeah, it's a terminal job. And uh, as it is for most of the lower court, judges, but a, a, a not insignificant number of district judges resign. They get a taxing job, tedious, and um, some of them go into arbitration, which is much more lucrative than being a judge. And the Supreme Court as a body that's selected through the appointment process, uh, you've written about the appointment process itself as influencing the political nature of the court. Not necessarily because of the political nature of the appointment, but just how the job is handed off imbues it with a political nature uh, and the justices' roles accordingly. But they're not, you know, they're not uh, puppets. They're individuals. They have their own way of playing, like you had with uh, Roberts and his umpire talk. Like, oh yeah, I'm an umpire. I call balls, I call strikes. Just kidding. <laughs> I do whatever I want. <laughs> uh, to a certain That's extent. That's what you said. Yeah. Uh, so there's that. There's a, there's a political role that the judges, the justices have that is because of the unique nature of the judiciary as a career role, right? And I think you've gone into that topic before. Uh, can you, have you dug into that any further since you discussed that in your book, How Judges Think, or in your foreword, the idea of low rungs to climb on the ladder, you have you know, district appellate justice level, most justices are being picked out of either previous appellate experiences. Right, uh, eight or nine now. Yeah. Or, yeah, or, 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 or. So there's a type of uh, competitiveness to be good enough to be an appellate justice because you might be routed out towards a Supreme Court nod after that, but there's not as much competitiveness as you would have in an electoral fashion in which like, you have here in, te in, in Texas. Uh, or the state judges, you know, run for election right. and have right. to do a political game to become a judge. Uh, so there's another type of an influence that guides justices as they're being, you know, nominated. They're trying to get nominated into that role. Well, there are a lot of um, uh, a significant number of court of appeals judges were district judges. So district judges do have a shot at, at becoming court of appeals judges. Not all want to, by any means, but those who do, you know, may try to um, attract and support politically influential people. Excuse me. Pardon? Oh. 
Okay, I have a video conference that I have to go to. Well, I appreciate it, Your Honor.